It doesn't mean that she's wrong, that she's pro-cop. The issue is whether she makes a case. And the case is painfully clear, and I'm willing to, you know, I will eat crow if it turns out that she made all of this up. And folks, it's not about whether George Floyd was a good person. That's, that's not my point. We were lied to. And the whole issue, the whole way we think about George Floyd was wrong, including the way I thought of him until about 10 minutes ago. I had no idea that Derek Chauvin didn't kill him. Hey there, John. How you doing, man? Hey, Glenn. Glenn Lowry here, The Glenn Show, with John McWhorter. I teach at Brown University, and I'm John Paulson, Senior Fellow at the Manhattan Institute. The Manhattan Institute sponsors The Glenn Show. Every other week, I talk with John McWhorter. He's a professor at Columbia University, and he writes for The New York Times. Uh, so we're back uh, to talk about this and that. John, how you doing? I'm good, Glenn. And you know, this is, sorry to jump the gun, but this is going to be kind of an interesting episode. We're kind of coming around because I think one of the ones we did that had the most impact, as it were, was in 2020 in an episode in, I think, May, where we were both sitting just like this. I was at this desk talking into this mic, and I said, Glenn, we need to talk about this George Floyd thing. And something happened then. I think that that really, something clicked then, and I think we got a lot more viewers, et cetera. And neither one of us knew at the time that that was the case. It seemed George Floyd at the time felt like it was going to be this passing episode. And now here we are, a little older, got through the pandemic, got through all sorts of things, and we need to talk about George Floyd again. And um, you can take it from there. Well, yeah, I think that episode went viral, as they say, and it did It did bring us a lot of attention. And that was then May, uh, June of 2020, in the midst of the pandemic, Trump and Biden knocking heads for president or for leading to the, their nominations where they would end up knocking heads for president. Pandemic. Uh, what a fraught time. And then this uh, this. Uh, George Floyd phenomenon. Uh, we're talking about George Floyd because there has recently been released a documentary film called The Fall of Minneapolis, produced by a, a documentary filmmaking crew called uh, Alpha News. I think that's what they call themselves, Alpha News, Minneapolis-based, uh, led by uh, uh, Liz Collins, who's the writer uh, narrator uh, of the film and uh, J.C. Shea, who's the director of it. I'm looking at my notes just to try to get this right. Uh, it's up at Rumble for free. Anybody can look at it. We'll put the URL in the description of this post, uh, The Fall of Minneapolis. And it is a detailed uh, accounting, recounting uh, from a point of view, to be sure, of the events that uh, led to the death and then the aftermath of the death of, uh, of George Floyd in Minneapolis. That documentary film has just dropped, I mean, with a couple of weeks time, uh, we're uh, talking here on December 2nd and, um, we both viewed it and, and we have our, have our views about it. And it does, it's like a walk down memory lane. It's, it's like, you know, it seems like it raises, so long ago. Yeah. It raises a million questions. Um, I, I'll say for my part, it's very well done. Uh, they have original body cam footage that, that's uh, been uh, carefully uh, curated and uh, edited and whatnot. It gives you a sense the arrest of George Floyd, the trial of Derek Chauvin, the aftermath for the police department. Glenn, I want to interrupt very briefly. The body yeah. cam footage you haven't seen, folks. This isn't just the people standing there with their cell phones. This is crystal clear 2020 body cam footage. It looks like a movie of everything that happened in the whole 20 minutes before that, that makes all of it a very different story than what we've known. Anyway, go ahead. Go ahead. No, that's good. Uh, let's get going. You and I talking about this. Uh, I just was going to mention that, uh, ironically, Derek Chauvin was attacked in his prison, in a federal prison in Arizona, stabbed and injured seriously, a major uh, uh, medical threat stabs. to yeah. his life. 22 stabs, I didn't know that. Uh, just the other day, I mean, just within uh, a couple of weeks of this film having been, uh, having, having been uh, made public. And uh, that's, that's a coincidence that gives 
gives pause, that gives serious pause, because the film raises real questions about whether or not he got a fair trial in Minneapolis. It raises real questions about whether or not the narrative that comes out of the so-called murder, I said so-called, oh my God. (laughs) How dare I? How dare I (laughs) even begin to think critically about whether or not it's appropriate to say what happened to George Floyd was murder. Uh, And yet you're moved, uh, if you watch this film, I think, with an open head mind, you're moved to raise exactly that kind of question. So there we are. It's here we here we are. Here we are again. Like in 2016, we did one of these where I learned from you by uh, our friend Peter Moskos that the whole business of black men being at a unique risk of being killed by white cops is vastly distorted that these things happen to white people too. I always thought as as un-PC and unwoke as I supposedly am, I thought that the general narrative about black people and the cops was true. And I written about it now for 25 years and said, it's the last thing standing. It's the chimney that didn't burn down when the rest of the house did, et cetera. And then uh, you taught me that that needs a rethinking. On this one, in 2020, we talked about how every one of these cases of a white cop killing a black man turns out to not be what we thought. So, you know, it wasn't that George Zimmerman tapped Trayvon Martin on the shoulder. Who, excuse me, was not a cop. He was not a cop. He was a citizen, but go ahead. Yeah, that's an important point. Didn't tap him on the shoulder and they had an argument and George Zimmerman shot him in the face. That's not what happened. George Zimmerman shot him with Trayvon Martin on top of him, seeming like he might be about to kill him, which is just different. Mike Brown did not die with his hands up. He was trying to grab the gun of Darren Wilson and was lunging at him over and over again. It's always like that. But I always thought that with the George Floyd case, you couldn't argue with the basic facts. It seemed that this white cop had his knee on this man's neck, which seems so barbaric, but that's what the photo that you always see looks like, and that he couldn't breathe because the knee was on his neck and that he choked and died of asphyxiation. That seemed to be the fact with various people connected to the Minneapolis police force saying that they were unfamiliar with this move, this business of putting the knee on the neck, that that's not part of their training. And so the issue was, you know, why did that happen to George Floyd? Has something like that ever happened to a white person? In this case, it was Tony Timpa, who was killed in a very similar way, not, you know, too long before George Floyd. But I always thought, Yes, I've been happy to see Derek Chauvin going to jail. I have written about him as a murderer many, many times. And then look, look at this. Once again, we've been lied to. And I, and the sad thing, Glenn, is that nobody, you know, left of center is going to admit that any of this could be valid. Truth will not matter on this one. I think that's a really important point. And I wish we could come back to it. Uh, that is that the uh, epistemic dilemma that we're in of being able well to put. come to public agreement about what actually happened, and we're in a deep hole as a society because that's a you know that's a tough one. But I wanted to just call to mind the scene in the uh, documentary film that we're talking about called "The Fall of Minneapolis," which tells in an account sympathetic to the police officer's point of view, I think that should be said. It's not wrong for that. Uh, What happened in Minneapolis with the death of George Floyd and its aftermath. I wanted to call to mind the scene where the interviewer is with Derek Chauvin's mother, the mother of the cop, the the cop, the murderous cop. He has a mother. He's locked away for some interminable period of time. He got, you know, I can't even remember now, but I mean, it's hundreds of months. And Over 20 years. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a long time. And uh, the, the mother is saying, here's the training manual. The training manual showing a certain maximal restraint technique of uh, immobilizing a recalcitrant suspect, which has a photograph in it of a man with his knee on the shoulder, not the neck, the shoulder, not in an asphyxiating, but in an immobilizing manner, 
just as when you see the body cam footage of Derek Chauvin in that position, it's very, very, very similar. (laughs) This was not allowed to be introduced into evidence at trial. (laughs) The judge, who is depicted as having been biased against the cops in this documentary film, I don't know if that's true or false, but there is a point of view in the film. I think we have to acknowledge that. It's not wrong for being a point of view, but I think it's a point of view. Uh, I don't know the details about the judge who heard Derek Chauvin's case enough to be able to comment on whether or not he really is biased. I don't know that. The politics of Hennepin County, Minneapolis, Minnesota, I don't know that. But uh, the film does raise these kind of questions. A uh, police officer command- of commanding rank testifies at trial that uh, that technique was not a part of the training when trainers who spent decades training Minneapolis cops affirmed that, of course, it was a part of the training. Is this a trained Minneapolis Police Department technique? It is not. When I heard that, I really wanted to get up off my chair and yell, bullshit. So rather than a vicious white, malicious, nigger-hating cop, putting his knee on the neck of this poor, helpless man and strangling the life out of him. Something different from that actually happened. And, you know, you have to think, would he do that? You know, whatever kind of terrible person he supposedly is, or was, or could be, you put your knee on the person's neck? The idea being to asphyxiate the person or not knowing that that would be rather dangerous. It's the shoulder. And if you look at the picture, you can think if you're told that he put his knee on his neck, that it was the neck, but it's also the shoulder. And people, this is the important thing. This this is so important. He's saying, I can't breathe. Okay. But one, there are three things. One, if he's saying it in that clear, strong voice, it would appear that he could breathe. Okay. so. That was always a little strange, but maybe there's a point where you can say, I can't breathe, but you're getting dangerously little air, but still that stands. Two, this is what's important. In the body cam footage, which we've never seen, George Floyd was saying, I can't breathe when he was standing up straight and just being coaxed to get into the car. What they were trying to do was take him somewhere to get treatment because the the drugs were severely addling his mind. And he wouldn't get in the car. And he starts saying, breathing air, standing up. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. When nobody is anywhere near his neck or anything else. George Floyd was extremely high on fentanyl and meth to an extent that could have killed him sitting in a chair. If you're on fentanyl in particular, you get something called wooden chest where you can't breathe if you've got that much in you. That's how high he was. Now, the issue is not the morality of him being high, but he was saying, I can't breathe long before anybody had him on the ground. And then the third thing is this. What a lot of people are going to say is look at the agony of his face in the standard photo. It looks like he, he, he can't breathe. He's in agony. That grimace that we see is something that does move you. But if you look at the body cam footage we've never seen, George Floyd had that exact same look on his face when the cops just approached his car and said, get out. He was really messed up that night. I'm not moralizing. Just because I'm wearing a cardigan doesn't mean that I don't understand the joy of drugs and liquor. But he was majorly <laughs> fucked up. And it, was a day, as, it was during the day. It was not at night, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I'm making it at night. But it's, it, it's in daylight. And he, the cops come up and he's just, oh, God, oh, don't shoot me. And nobody has a gun. You know, I, I just lost my mother. His mother died years ago. Don't, you know, don't, don't. They weren't threatening him at all. He was really, really messed up, and he had that same look on his face. So I don't think, unless this is faked, you know, here we are in the age of AI. I mean, we have to allow that just maybe. But unless that body cam footage is faked, Derek Chauvin didn't kill that man. I never thought I'd be saying that. But it appears to be true. Are we missing anything? Do you remember Shelby Steele's film about uh, Ferguson, Eli and Shelby, his son, Eli Steele, the filmmaker, and Shelby Steele, the writer? 
I think they called it What Killed Michael Brown. And uh, in it, uh, Steele introduces this concept. I think he calls it uh, virtually true. It, it was, you know, true in effect. A narrative that is so in uh, uh, coordination with a sentiment that's widely held in the public that people want to believe that it's true because it provides additional evidence to what they've been telling you all along is the case about this country and about the lives of Black people in this country becomes unassailable. It, it, it becomes, in effect, true. It, it, it is, you know, a virtual truth. Poetic. That was his phrase. A poetic truth. I, I just love that phrase. Uh, and this is back to this question of whether or not you can actually say that Chauvin didn't kill uh, George Floyd. Because, I mean, think what that entails. That means all that rioting, looting, and burning, uh, all, all of that uh, civil disorder, that has had and will continue to have political ramifications uh, echoing down across the years? What was that for? Um, or what about imprisoning those police officers? I mean, for crying out loud, Derek Chauvin is locked away for a lifetime. And, and the other cops also got jail time, too. One of them is black. <laughs> That's another one, thing. The the one who's K E U N G, and so you think he's Vietnamese or something? He's black. Yeah, yeah. right. Uh, and a veteran uh, police officer who worked in the academy training other police officers said that he was probably the best recruit that he had seen in a quarter century of service. Uh, just as an aside, but but they were and are being punished unjustly. If indeed you conclude as you have just done that uh, Floyd wasn't murdered out there. What about that? Um, what about fueling a false narrative? What, what about giving further credence to a way of thinking about yourself within your country that is untrue to the reality of your condition? Well, the, the cost here is inestimable. It, it, you know? You know, Glenn, also, if you want to push it, if you think about what happened in the first half of 2020, also the whole racial reckoning and the grievous excesses that it's led to that make people write books like Woke Racism, et cetera. I mean, frankly, we have to do it. We have to say it. And then we're going to move quickly on. The elevation of Ibram Kendi really was sparked in large part Oh, yeah. By George Floyd. He was, you know, he was known before that, but him being a phenom whose counsel is attended to by people cowering in their boots at becoming amoral people if they don't follow it, that happens in the wake of George Floyd. And it was a lie. It was a lie. I mean, unless we're talking about AI creating that footage. I am still trying to grapple with the meaning. Of this, And so what it comes down to is, George Floyd, he had serious heart disease. He wasn't an old man, but he had serious heart disease, untreated. He had serious atherosclerosis, untreated. He was very high on both fentanyl and meth, which is a lethal combination. Very high on them, probably taking more while he was in the car to hide it from the cops. He opens his mouth in the footage and you see he's got something on his tongue. It's not a chiclet. He's really, really high. He had COVID. He tested positively for COVID then. He had COVID. He smoked. He's a very sick man. And then all of this happens. He's frankly out of his mind because of all of this. He couldn't help it, but he was. And, you know, he was upset. He was agitated. And that, his heartbeat probably, you know, pumping harder. Now I'm going into a medical expertise I don't have. But he was very agitated at being detained by the cops. And remember, they had a reason for detaining him. He was trying to pass counterfeit money. They were detaining him. And it got worse and worse. He couldn't understand that he needed to just calm down, despite being told to by his friends. Just, you know, stop resisting, Floyd, one of his friends said. And so... It got the best of him, and his heart stopped. But it wasn't because he was asphyxiated. And the other thing is, there was no evidence 
in the autopsy report, which has not been shared with us until now, not the autopsy report that was suggested by George Floyd's relatives, but the first one, there was no evidence of asphyxiation of any kind, not physical, not subtler things that most of us don't understand, no evidence. Now, Glenn, I don't know. Is there, I've looked this up and I can't find it. Is there a such thing as somebody being asphyxiated, but there is no evidence? You can't tell. Maybe that's true, but none was found. So Derek Chauvin well, didn't cut off his oxygen. The, the, Go ahead. I mean, I'm, you know, devil's advocate here. There was a trial. The, the whole issue is, uh, is, these are questions of fact. The jury was uh, uh, presented with evidence and uh, made a finding of fact. So who are we to to second guess this after the after the fact? In in other words, to to support this line of critique that you're making of the standard narrative on this, we have to go to the courtroom and we have to, in effect, say that that process did not give a uh, full uh, hearing uh, to all the relevant uh, evidence, such as that that you're calling attention to right now. And then why not? So what was admitted into evidence and all of that? That's that's a rabbit hole. Well, they weren't given enough evidence, it seems clear. And it's because of what you're talking about in terms of the poetic aspect of this. And it's so frustrating. No one's going to listen. Well, what about jury intimidation? Excuse me for interrupting. I Go ahead and finish it. Uh, it is that. I mean, the cult, frankly, the culture that we're in, it shows how far we've come on race. The culture that we're in is such that not only would the jury feel intimidated in terms of maybe somebody coming after them because of this kind of street vigilante justice, but also just as moral actors. A lot of them probably felt, here's this person with the knee on the neck, that must be what happened, and therefore we are going to do what is obviously the right thing. And then there are all sorts of people at many places on the flowchart who would feel the same way, and therefore the made judge- sure... Go ahead. Yeah, the judge declined to uh, a motion to change the venue out of Minneapolis, uh, given the uh, publicity adverse to the police officers in that venue. Declined uh, to sequester the jury so that they were uh, they were not supposed to, but were uh, empowered to do so if they were to elect to do so. Inform themselves about commentary that was ongoing. There was a mob outside of that courthouse. The courthouse had to be uh, reinforced and fortified and protected because of a fear that it would fall under attack in the event that the wrong jury, wrong jury decision were to be uh, announced. Uh, Speeches were given by prominent politicians, in effect saying, burn this B-I-T-C-H down, not literally saying that, but in effect, goading the crowd on, we want a guilty verdict. We want a guilty verdict. We don't have to name the politicians. We know who they are. Uh, if, you know, the image, <laughs> God help me, of a rabid lynch mob outside of a courthouse somewhere in the American South in the 1930s, where a black man is on trial for something heinous that he may not have actually done, comes to mind. <laughs> Uh, and that's how it's going to be seen by a lot of people. This is another point that I wanted to make. Just because the New York Times, with respect, John, doesn't uh, see the problem here, doesn't mean that there are not gazillion people, some of them vote for Donald Trump, who do see the problem here. Uh, The excesses of a woke moral panic around racial issues that converted a miscreant. He had a rap sheet as long as your arm. You look at that video of his arrest. It, it's, it's hard to watch, actually. This is not a heroic figure. This is a flaky motherfucker. Well, everybody's going to say that's irrelevant, despite the fact that it's true. Well, no, no. It's not irrelevant to whether or not he should be buried in a gold casket pulled by a horse-drawn case on. That is true. It's not irrelevant to whether or not he should go down in the annals of American history as a heroic figure 
with squares named after him and children being invited to view him and what happened to him in iconic terms as relevant to their own lives. And there's an opera about him. Also. Of course there is. That's, you know, one of the hardest things. And I don't want to think about it too much because you have to keep it surgical. Was he murdered? But the idea of him as a hero is revolting. Absolutely revolting. And so, for example, the people who have written about, I'm going to leave unnamed, that he was a father. We've talked about that. He was a dad. He was a father. He was not. He had five kids out of wedlock and moved away from the town where he lived, which shows that he was not a father in any meaningful sense. And yet we're supposed to think about him as a father. No, you and I are fathers. He couldn't, he couldn't handle that. And yet his, his biography, the man was an utter and complete mess. That's certainly true. And the idea that we're going to have operas written about him and there's going to be a wonderful movie where somebody who looks like Larry Fishburne is going to play him, et cetera, as a flawed but noble human being who got asphyxiated by a white asshole. No, no, no. It, it's... We can do better. And I wish we could do better than the fact that, as I've always said, what keeps the race debate from really making any progress is a sense that to be black is to live ever in fear of being victimized by racist cops whose murders are determined by subliminal racism. That is a vast exaggeration of something that may have been true 50 years ago, but is not true now. But all of the oversensitivity, all of the hyper-wokeness about race, there are various things you might refer to in terms of societal racism, but what really drives it in people's gut is the cops. And time and time again, you find that the story that you're told about the latest episode is not true. I had no idea that this was yet another one of them, but here it is. And it's going to be the saddest thing. It makes you want to just fly away sometimes that this evidence is clear, but it will not be accepted. People will just, if, and, but, what about? The idea will have to be that Derek Chauvin cut off that man's air supply and killed him, despite the fact that, quite simply, he did not. Or some people will say, well, okay, maybe it wasn't quite that, but he agitated him so much he shouldn't have pushed him down on the ground, and that's what killed him. When, frankly, he could have dropped dead standing up based on what you see in the body cam footage and what his medical condition was like. It will not be allowed that Derek Chauvin got a bad rap. It will not be allowed as truth. And frankly, the utter resistance to sense, to logic, to truth on this, is the same sad aspect of human cognition that has so many other people pretending that Donald Trump didn't lose that election. It's the same thing. Anybody who <laughs> finds that pathetic has no business engaging the evidence that we're talking about and still insisting that George Floyd was murdered by Derek Chauvin. It's the I, same I can't go with that equivalence, John. I can't. I, I can't. What? It's what? Not, it's how not how is it not the same? How is it not the same? Oh, each one is its own thing. And I mean, uh, we're talking on the one hand about a moral panic around racial issues that issued in uh, the summer of 2020. And on the other hand, about a disputed election. I mean, how are they the same thing? They're not the same thing at all. I think, I think what you mean, <laughs> excuse me for seeming <laughs> condescending, <laughs> is that you can fathom neither of them, uh, that they both represent, in your point of view, some sense of a departure from reality. And I'll give you that much, but they're not the same things, not at all. I think. Same thing. But in, in any case, uh, I mean... <laughs> I don't want to argue the election with you, John, please. Uh, you know, but let's save that for another day. Uh, Trump is, <laughs> is going to be on the ballot again. We'll have another election to talk about. We can start. He, he lost. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> I knows it. I, I, I don't dispute that he lost the election, John. I want to be clear about that. Uh, mm -hmm. and, I, and I am not going there with you to talk about the election because we're talking about Minneapolis. I want to make a difference. I watched this documentary film. It's an hour and a half. You should all watch it. Uh, Liz Collins. J.C. Shea. And it doesn't uh, make her wrong that she's pro-cop. I think Alpha we can all News, understand that. They're, they're based in Minneapolis. They did a good job with this thing. One thing that came through to me that moved me was the humanity of the police, including Derek Chauvin, 
whose voice you hear in the film because they speak with him on a telephone from his uh, position of confinement and who has just been stabbed 12 times into within an inch of his life. 22 times. Because, of course, 22 times, my God. Because, of course, he murdered hero George Floyd. I mean, that whole narrative is messed up. But in any case, let me not lose my train of thought. The humanity of the police. Uh, Eric Chauvin had a mother. There was an esprit de corps amongst those professionals who were doing a very difficult job to the best of their capacities. They're not scumbag, murderous racists. They don't come across like that at all. When they give up that precinct station that was burnt to the ground, whatever the number was, let's call it the third precinct, I don't remember, but it was the place from which the officers who were trying to arrest George Floyd had been dispatched. And therefore, the site at which a mob of angry people massed, seeking, I don't know what exactly, the mayor, Jacob Fry, of the city of Minneapolis, directed that that precinct be abandoned by the police officers to that mob. You had thousands of people outside the third precinct. And the likelihood of very serious injury and death was high. That was not a consequence that I could have on my watch. The policemen gathering their precious evidence and other our firearms and other such materials that couldn't be left to a mob are racing out the back of the precinct as the mob is coming in the front door for their lives. The building is burnt to the ground. No National Guard. No effort to draw a line. Who made that decision? Why? Why was that decision made? What does it mean when you allow something like that to happen? This. Well, we could begin to parse it. I assume the concern is that if you confront that mob, there are going to be casualties and there's going to be a melee and that's going to be a worse thing. And therefore, the lesser of the evils at hand is to allow them to take over the station. And I guess it's easy for me to sit in my parlor and to second guess that call. But I think history is going to read it as, as a kind of concession that is to be regretted. Uh, is is emblematic of a more general spinelessness with which a variety of authorities leading all the way up to the presidential candidate and vice presidential candidate of the Democratic Party in the year 2020, to people kneeling with kente cloth around them, uh, anyway, I ramble. You don't ramble. It's a month after that mob here in New York, then Mayor Bill de Blasio, had been breaking up Hasidic weddings, et cetera, because of the pandemic, which made sense, but then sanctioned people out on the street, cheek by jowl, chanting about George Floyd, saying that racial issues like that were more important than issues concerning the communication of a disease for which there was then no vaccine. That struck me as medieval. That was one of about five things that made me write woke racism. I thought, this is, this is religion. It might as well be 1250 somewhere in France. This has nothing to do with logic. These people are kneeling at an altar. Very clear with that mayor <laughs> in Minneapolis. He looks like the actor Paul Sands from from the early 70s to just the, the saintly air about him. Clearly, he just has a sense of what it is to be a good person. Damn the facts. He fell to his knees weeping at George Floyd's funeral. With his curly locks. Yeah. And he meant this. He had religion. He had religion in him. This really won't do. What are we living in, Glenn? What is this? There are times when I wish I lived either in the deep past or at least 100 years from now. This sucks. People are not going to listen to the facts. George Floyd is going to be seen as this 
crucial moment on the civil rights timeline when America woke up to certain realities because of the murder of this man. And nothing we say, nothing that documentary says, will change anyone's mind. But I invite people who watch us to just look at that documentary. Spend, spend an hour and a half, pour yourself a cup of coffee, and find that what we thought in early 2020 about the quote-unquote murder of George Floyd has been a massive web of bullshit once again. It's a tragedy. Glenn, what do you think, what do we do about this? Is there anything constructive to be said? I don't think anybody will listen. And so yeah. the race debate will continue with that as an assumption among anybody who is a millimeter left of center. Uh, well, we warn that you are playing with fire when you cling to narratives so uh, clearly at variance with the reality which is available to be seen by any fair-minded, open-minded person who can look at it, you play with fire. And maybe here, to this extent, I can agree with you, John, about a comparison of that to the dead-enders who say that Trump won the 2020 election. The dangers are very significant um, because, uh, you know... <laughs> I have this thing I say that the woke, uh, wokesters are bluffing when they say the black family is not a real issue or they say crime in the cities is down, not up. What's wrong with you? Larry Krasner type. Uh, Philadelphia is not really a problem of, you know, or whatever, because everybody can see that it is. And they're daring you to contradict them because then you'll look like a racist if you do. Um, but here, I think maybe I'm on firmer ground. Uh, you, you say, no, people really believe what they're saying. They're just deluded. They're not, they're not so cynical as to know that they're wrong and be daring you to call them on it. Uh, but, but here, uh, you, you might be right. I mean, uh, they, or I might be right. <laughs> I might be right that, uh, <sighs> Who could really believe that George Floyd was a hero? Who, who, who could really think <laughs> that what happened to him is emblematic of blackness in America? That he embodies our aspiration, that he's Rosa Parks? <laughs> who could think that? <laughs> so, so, and conversely, those cops who were rotting in prison who really thinks that they're, uh, uh, you know, Bull Connor types, uh, you know, warrior cops lording it over poor black people uh, who are at their mercy for their, you know, whatever. People want them to be that. Really, really they get off that. on thinking of them as that because they think that makes them good people to characterize them that way. I don't know. Ugh. But you asked what can be done, that. and I, I, all I can say is, you know, ca call it the way you see it and, and have the courage of your convictions and whatnot, and warn, warn against the backlash that, that I, I fear is not yet fully played out. Uh, I, you know, you want to talk about Trump and people who think he won that election. I want to talk about Trump and the fact that he's ahead in the polls. Y you know. Uh, people say he's a threat to democracy. I want to say the only way he's a threat to democracy is that democracy might put him back in office. And if you don't stop and ask yourself why that's so, how could he possibly be so far ahead and name your state? Then you're not being serious. And I think that this kind of thing where the people who control the megaphones decide that this is what we're going to believe about something and patently our lying eyes are telling us something to the contrary of what they have, are telling us. And I think that's what uh, The Fall of Minneapolis, the film that the Alpha News Group has produced coming out of uh, Minneapolis, Liz Collins and J.C. Shea, is, is, is a harbinger. Because uh, I think you look at that with an open mind and you come away saying, you know, you know they what lied gonna, to us. You know what it's going to be? The way these things actually go is that after 20 years or so, people 
admit the truth. So, for example, this goes back to OJ, where it was plain from the beginning what he did. And yet, to be a good <laughs> black person, you were supposed to pretend. And if you tried to tell the truth as a black person, you were treated as if you had a disease. And now, everybody opens up. You know, I think the official moment was in the Barbershop movie, when the Cedric, the entertainer character, you know, basically says, OJ lied. And I thought, oh, you can now say this in, in public? And now nobody, you, know, you, you don't even need to pretend. In this case, it's going to be like that. You know, that documentary is going to get around. There's something called the internet. You don't have to go to a theater to see it. And enough people are going to see it to see that we were lied to about George Floyd. But the problem is, I really think that Black America and its fellow travelers have a certain job to do, which is that we need to admit it now. Because, yeah, Glenn, there are people watching us, you know, from the center to the right, who are tired of this. And frankly, who scorn this. It's Difficult to make the case for black equality when there is this kind of know-nothing denialism about cases like this. It shouldn't take 20 years for people to admit that those riots were about something that didn't happen. It should be now. Or you and I shouldn't be treated as bizarre or pariahs or disloyal to our race or as having an alternate agenda in just speaking what is obviously the truth. Now, of course, maybe we, we've been lied to somehow, but I think the evidence in this case is such that we are certainly legitimate people to make a case and to call attention to the documentary. Liz Collin is married to an ex-cop. She's pro-cop. Yes, that doesn't mean that she's lying in itself. All of us can understand that. It doesn't mean that she's wrong, that she's pro-cop. The issue is whether she makes a case. And the case is painfully clear. And I'm willing to, you know, I will eat crow if it turns out that she made all of this up. But based on what's there, plus things that always seem a little odd, such as someone saying in a loud, clear voice repeatedly, I can't breathe, and yet having oxygen cut off, given how implausible so many things always seem. And folks, it's not about whether George Floyd was a good person. That's, that's not my point. We were lied to. And the whole issue, the whole way we think about George Floyd was wrong, including the way I thought of him until about 10 minutes ago. I had no idea that Derek Chauvin didn't kill him. But here we are. Okay, I, we should probably call this too close, but I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this. I, I, I think it's about way more than George Floyd. I think George Floyd is not alone. I think the streets of American cities are full of George Floyds. I, I think that the, the problem uh, is a lot harder than there's a bunch of racist cops and we need to root them out by getting rid of qualified immunity and making sure that they lose their pensions. Um, and, and I think that uh, the uh, papering over of the, of the real problem, what do I mean by the real problem? The disorder engendered by the misbehavior, sometimes vicious, of too many people in our midst who have not developed their capacities of conduct and performance in society to a level where they don't constitute menaces to those who are around them. The existence of which necessitates uh, the, the use of police officers to uh, maintain order uh, and to create an environment in which there's somebody to call when that guy is in your face. That's the problem. There's a racial dimension to that problem. It's not structural racism 2.0. It's a lot more complicated and a lot more painful to confront than that. Some of it has to do with the internal dynamic of culture and social organization within African-American society. The charade of a gold casket pulled by a caisson to bury this miscreant and the concentration of the aspirations, the political aspirations, the claim on public attention of black people around that to the exclusion of actually confronting the root of the rot that produced that is a historic mistake of unimaginable proportion. We're going into the second quarter of the 21st century and Oakland, St. Louis, New Orleans, Houston, Chicago, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Cleveland, et cetera, 
uh, are still confronting this problem. Now, if you think abolishing the police is a solution to this problem, you've got your head up your ass. You're not a serious person. So this is not just about George Floyd. It's time to call the whole thing off, this charade. And Obama should have done it. Obama and Eric Holder should have begun a process of reversing this moral panic. Instead, they, they fostered it. But that's not what we came here to talk about. That, I'll, I'll let that be the end you of know, my Glenn, I, I agree with you on that now. You're right. Those two men should have spoken truth to us in clear language repeatedly at that time. When I was living through that time, I didn't see that. But yeah, you're right. That was a missed opportunity. And I would also add this. When we talk about we or we talk about the black community, I think it, I don't know how you feel about this, Glenn, but we're not talking about these quote unquote black leaders. It's not about what Al Sharpton should be saying or anything like that these days. And maybe it's just because I wear cardigans. I think it's writers. I think it's the media that needs to take responsibility. It's the people who really shape thought. It's not Jesse Jackson anymore. It's people like, you know, ta Coates and, you know, Michael Eric Dyson and... And Jelani Cobb, who's dean and, of your university school of journalism. Yeah, Jelani, Jelani Cobb. It's people like that who I think... Charles Blow, who writes at your newspaper. All of those people, I think, are responsible for, I would have to gently say, being more open to the reality of these things and a genuine progressivism. I would at least hope that that could be true. Those are the leaders. They are the leaders today. To change thought, to change what we do, it's the writerly class who are online and who, who are heard today in a way that they weren't 50 years ago. It's not about ministers, although they're, they're going to play a part too. But yes, yeah, something that, that a fundamental perspective needs to change. I can only hope that there's a young intellectual out there today who's going to become a historian and write a big book about this period in American history. I don't care what, color. I don't care what color this person is. Who will hear this conversation and will feel compelled to shape a narrative uh, that reflects some of the, the complexities and, and that avoids some of the pitfalls that we have been trying in our humble way here at Glenn and John to, to identify. I can only hope. You think it's Coleman? I would love for him to do it. He could yeah, do it. Me too. And, and I agree. He, he could do it. All right, John. Uh, that's a wrap. Uh, for Glenn and John, uh, George Floyd 2.0. Everybody should see the film. It's called The Fall of Minneapolis, uh, produced by the Alpha News Group out of Minneapolis, uh, Liz Collins and J.C. Shea. See you in two weeks, John. See you in two weeks, Glenn.